Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and father figures out there. And thank you all for being here in the Father's house this morning. Um, if you will, please rise. Let's sing together. of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Church. We are glad you are here on this special Father's Day. Um, we've got a few announcements we wanted to bring up and uh, make you aware. And many of those can be found in your bulletin. Um, one, one of the things I want to mention is uh, First Church has what we call a social ministry. Facebook and Instagram primarily. You, you may have begun over the last couple of months to see a, a bit more posting, a bit more emphasis. There's an online devotional. There's a Friends at First on Friday, and, and some in the room have done very well in that. There's been a tremendous response. And I uh, encourage you to go online if you're not connected to go ahead and, and become followers of First Church. 
uh, like, share, comment, and uh, become a part of an engagement there that uh, we're really trying to emphasize because, believe it or not, there are more people watching us online than are showing up on Sunday. So there's a community out there, and we're trying to engage them, and this is just one of the tools that we're using. Um, also, we are celebrating the thrift store. We'll be closing on June the 24th at 2 p.m. Um, people have asked why. There's an art to ending well. This ministry has been around for around 20 years, has raised thousands of dollars, helped countless people with clothing and various items they might need in life. And um, at this point, uh, many of you may know, that the bus station is going to be torn down. And th that area is going to be converted to parking. And part of that process is what do we do with the thrift store? And we started looking and talking with the leadership there. And uh, many of them are mature. And they feel like um, their, their ministry has shifted and what they're serving now is different from what they started and they felt like this is a time to make a break. So we, we really want to celebrate what they have done and, and lift them up and try and uh, appreciate their efforts and gratitude. Also, um, July the 1st is our All-American Celebration Patriotic Concert. Uh, be on the lookout for that. I think that's uh, July the 1st at Surfside United Methodist Church. And then... Habitat for Humanity, we have volunteer days that we are going to be helped with the building of a Habitat house July the 1st and July the 29th. Both are Saturdays. So uh, those of you who are, are able and willing to come and work, those who can, and, and can yield a ha wield a hammer, that's awesome. There are also opportunities for those who just want to clean up and serve and be present. So don't let uh, your ability or your age be an impediment to volunteering. Um, Vacation Bible School is doing well. It's coming up on uh, July the 17th. And the uh, challenge that Michelle and Joel put out the last couple of weeks has been tremendous. Uh, we've had 47 people step forward and say, I want to be a part of Vacation Bible School. Thank you for that. There are still a few spots here and there, but uh, at this point, it's manageable. It's not frightening. Um, and for those who are interested in Vacation Bible School as an adult, there is an opportunity. Our very own Tommy Britton is going to be leading an adult study for Vacation Bible School, so I encourage you to join in on that. I think it'll be very educational and entertaining. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, Sunday School Substitute Teachers. We have an opportunity over the summer to allow those who teach regularly our Sunday school classes a chance to catch a break. And so we have asked for volunteers. The uh, uh, children's age filled up a little quicker. And inside your bulletin, you'll see a, a sign-up sheet. And over here with about three or four dates are the little kids and then second grade to fifth grade, and then over here on this side with all these dates available, that's for the youth, our junior and senior high. I encourage you to consider volunteering to lead those Sunday school classes. Now, I'll go ahead and forewarn you, you are probably not going to get an engaging, resounding applause or gratitude. But they're listening. And maybe more importantly, they're watching. So if you would, if you're interested in any of those opportunities, fill this out and return it. You can drop it in the offering basket. And let's see what else we got. Is that good? All right. Well, before we, before we go to the next song, I wanted to take a moment to say Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to those who are biological fathers and those who are father figures. When I look back over my life, it's not just my dad who contributed. There were coaches, scoutmasters, and teachers who saw something in me that I didn't see. And so 
for those of you who may fit in that category, thank you. The world, the culture right now would have you believe as a father, especially sitcoms. You are incompetent, <laughs> irrelevant, and, and a couple of other things we're not going to talk about. But nothing could be further from the truth. You make a huge difference. And if this were a sermon, which I'm kind of getting into, um, we, would, we would look at the statistics. Whether it's teen pregnancy, whether it's dropout, whether it's incarceration, the presence of a father figure in those lives makes a huge difference. And so I want to say thank you for standing in the gap. So if you would, take a moment, if you are so inclined, use your mobile device. You can check in your attendance on the Realm app or on the Pew pads that you uh, passed around from the ends of the pews. And I will leave it at that, y'all. We are looking forward to God being in this place with us this morning. Let's take a moment and pass the peace and love of Christ with each other. Greet your neighbors. Say hello to someone you don't know. And if y'all will, please remain standing. We'll continue worship.
Please be seated. And at this time, we invite the children to come forward for our children's moment with Miss Michelle. That was nice. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you. Happy Father's Day. I know everyone's been celebrating their dad and all the special men in their life today. Um, can you tell me what it is that makes your dad so special? What does your dad do that's so special? A a cabinet? A, he, made the, he made the cabinets? Wow. Well, that is special. Well, all dads give something very special. And I find that a lot of people say that it's love, that their dad gives them love and their dad teaches them how to do things, lots of different things. And that's what my dad did. My dad has always shown me love and he's always taught me things. And a lot of us in here are very fortunate to have great dads that are here with us and are a part of us, our lives. And some of us don't. Some of our, our fathers here on earth are not here for whatever reason. But the good news is, is that we all have a very, very special father. And that is our heavenly father. And no matter how sad we may get or how scared we may get, or even if we are mad at our dad, we have a heavenly father that we can turn to that will love us and teach us and show us what's right. And that's a great thing. And so we can always cling to that. So if you will, bow your head, close your eyes. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for fathers. Thank you for your promises. Help us to be our best and to show love in all that we do. In your name and will we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Miss Michelle. Yes. You can go with me too. As, yes. as the kids make their way to Little Church, there goes the future. And um, we appreciate their presence. If you would, remember to sign the registration pad so in your attendance. And at this time, the ushers would come forward for tithes and offerings.
send for a heart singing hallelujah, As we come to this time of prayer, there's a couple of things I want to remind you. One is the family of Larry Gates, who passed away this week. And the second is, in this prayer, there will be a time for prayer requests to be lifted up. Uh, you, you can do that by name or topic and just leave it at that. The Lord knows what our needs are. Let us pray. Abba, Father, it's Jim again with a few of my friends. We come before you with open hands, open hearts, and open minds. Pour into us that which you would have us know. On this special day of celebrating fatherhood, we thank you for our fathers and those father figures who poured love into us, even when it felt like discipline. We thank you for putting them in our lives. May they feel valued and appreciated. May they understand the impact they make upon lives in the world. Dear Lord, we pray for those who have left to go to Saukahatchee Summer Service. That they might lend their skills and their hands to the repair of homes of the poor. As it gets hot and dirty and sweaty this week, Lord, meet them where they are. They might have spirit-filled moments of service. 
Take these young people and shape their lives and give them your perspective. Dear Lord, we hunger and thirst for you. We are hungry for your word and your love. May the message this morning resonate in our hearts and may we hear what it is you would have us say. Dear Lord, we raise up the names of those who are heavy on our hearts. Address them as only you can in your perfect will. Take us, Lord, broken vessels that we might pour your love upon the world that needs to see it, that needs to feel it. We may be the only Christ they ever see. May our actions speak volumes about you. We ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture lesson for this morning is Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you here. Be in our midst. Take our thoughts and think through them. Speak through our lips so that your word will be lifted. If you speak, unless you speak, nothing of significance will be said. Give us your word, Lord Jesus. Amen. This morning we find ourselves at the end of a series on the Beatitudes. And there's, I went ahead and uh, had the whole text for that, uh, I read aloud, and I'm going to focus on one verse. But those who may not have been here for the whole series, I thought it was a good way to finish it up, to hear them all. And um, we've, we've skipped around, so usually, <laughs> if it's 12 verses and we're ending on verse 6, it's a little awkward. So that's the reason we're ending there. Um, this would have been what many call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was gathered with his disciples and was giving them great wisdom. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but perhaps many of you are like our world. And our theme song could be the 1965 Rolling Stones hit, Satisfaction. Ironically, you find in its lyrics, Mick Jagger is anything but satisfied. 
I can't get no satisfaction. I tried and I tried. And I tried and I tried. And through the whole song, this is a theme. Are we trying to fill our lives with the same stuff? Perhaps this piece of passage will help. Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. As we look at this verse, we're confronted with hunger and thirst. As as many times as we might say, I am hungry or I am thirsty, I dare say that many of us have ever felt true hunger, true thirst. Jesus' disciples and those that gathered around him would know that. For there was no refrigeration. There was only limited means of preserving food. A drought could devastate a population. Through wells drying up or agriculture being unable to grow. They knew how to live life on the edge. Dependency. But the terms that the writer used in this, the hunger and thirst, is active. It's current. It is ongoing. There's continued hunger, continued thirst, as if your life depended on it. The passage is calling us to pursue righteousness as an all-consuming passion. Some of my research for this message led me to um, Reverend Colin Smith from OpenTheBible.org. And he shared some thoughts on hunger that I thought I would, would pass along. One is hunger is a sign of need. Hunger can tell you that it's been too long since you ate. Too long since you drank something. It's an indication your body is in a state of need. It can be recognition that you lack righteousness. You sense that you are not content in your sin. There's a restlessness there. Your sinfulness troubles you. The blessing is for the one who recognizes this hunger. I'm missing something. Hunger is a sign of life. It is not necessary to teach a newborn baby to be hungry. It requires no instruction. It requires no mentoring. It happens. And a lot of us fall into those same attributes when it comes to other hungers in life. We just fall into it. Our sinful flesh hungers and we feed it. Our, the, the thing to recognize is that our, our sinful flesh never hungers for righteousness. That is the Holy Spirit in you. Calling you. Pulling you. Leading you to the holiness of Christ. That is our calling. Thirdly, hunger is a sign of health. A healthy appetite is a good sign. Usually when you've been sick and you begin to get your appetite back, that's a good thing. The opposite of that is when your appetite starts to fall. That's an indicator too. Often our appetite for righteousness and holiness begins to drift, begins to fall. There's something in that message too. That we're drawing away. We're drawing away from holiness and righteousness. We need to be continually seeking 
to go deeper and deeper with Christ. A Christian will never feel like they are righteous. That, that was what the Pharisees did. Look at us. We're righteous. We kept all 600 plus rules and regulations of the law. We are the ones to look to. True followers of Jesus are righteous. I am a broken man. And if it weren't for the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, I would be lost. Amen. He is calling to us. It's not just a one-time fire insurance. I'm yours, Jesus. Okay, I'm good. I can do whatever I want to now. I, I check that box. It is a continual, daily, hourly refinement. Every day. If you're driving in Myrtle Beach traffic, you need Jesus. <laughs> if you're a father raising teenagers, you need Jesus. <laughs> but we keep inch and inch. Some days it is, is a milestone. Some days it feels like I hardly moved. But it's a continual thing. We're with a holy passion pursuing Christ. Good news is, he's been pursuing us since the day we were born. Now, if we continue in, in this verse, hunger and thirst for righteousness. What is righteousness? What is it we are hungry and thirsty for? Righteousness is an alignment between you and the Lord. The closer and closer we align with Christ, the more we will reflect Him in everything we think, say, and do. That is righteousness. The holiness. We don't deserve to be in the presence of holiness. One sin in a lifetime, you're, you're, you're dust. Sorry. That is holiness. And that is the beauty of Jesus. He paid for that sin on the cross. A, a sin I could not pay for. He did. That is the standard we're trying to achieve. We'll, we'll not get there this side of heaven. But our hunger and our thirst, that's what he wants. It's not the achievement. It's not you cross the, fin you cross the finish line when you, when you pass away. But in this life, we are continually working to that. It's not for the audience of other humans. This is not about my holiness versus yours. This, we do this for the Lord. He is the audience. It's like, it's like worship. We come here and feel that we should be entertained. No, no, we're here to worship God. It may be entertaining, but that's not the point. So what will we settle for in our desires? Will our desires draw us closer to righteousness and holiness? Because whatever we think will satisfy us becomes our consuming passion. It becomes a consuming passion. He wants to be the object of that desire. Not the desires of the world. In pursuing righteousness, we're made right with the Lord we are in communion with him and we'll become more and more Christ-like. So, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be filled. Some, some translations use that as, as we will be satisfied. We will be filled. 
Okay. What about that? Let me. I, I'm not going to ask for another. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But just think about this for a minute. If I ask you to rate your satisfaction on a scale from one to ten, with one being I don't want to get out of bed, to ten, I don't want to go to bed. I'm going to miss something. Where would you fall? Would you be close to the one? Or closer to the 10. If you look at a barometer of the world, it's on the low end of that scale. We don't have to be. Perhaps the world and some of us are trying to fill a God shaped hole in our hearts with world shaped. De- Desires. Say, relationships. Relationships can be a beautiful blessing. But when I'm expecting my dear wife to fill everything, that's putting her on a pedestal in which she doesn't belong. She's not a savior. As amazing as she is, she's not perfect. And we have good days and we have bad days. That other person needs saving too. It's like the blind helping the blind. Maybe it's in possessions. If I got a bigger house, a nicer car, a bigger ring, some more fashionable clothes, I'm good. No. The glitter fades, the luster's gone, and yesterday's can't do without is in the goodwill pile. What we need is permanent. What we need is a savior. For some of us, we might look for applause and accomplishments, maybe another degree. Maybe getting that promotion, winning this award, scoring that touchdown, and I'm going to be fulfilled. I will finally be happy. I'll be happy when. The world is going to disappoint us every time. Because the applause is going to fade at some point. Those of us who had success in business or sports or whatever. At some point you find yourself looking back. Back in the day. They will leave you hunger, hungry and thirsting for more. You will not be filled. If we look at John... Chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He's not necessarily talking about, I'll never need water or bread. He's talking about the food of your soul. The nourishing of your spirit is dependent upon him and accepting him. Now, I warn you, the enemy is going to bombard you. The enemy, the devil, he is going to bombard you with distractions. It's easier to distract you than to make you evil. But if the distractions keep you from coming to know Jesus, the result's the same. He doesn't have to make you a demon. He just has to distract you enough that you don't know Jesus. A little bit further in John, John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Thirst and hunger for righteousness is a life 
long endeavor. You learn more. The more you learn, the more you realize there is to learn. And I think of it somewhat like an athlete. You probably played little league sports. And depending on what you played or where position you played, sometimes, say, an offensive lineman, when the little league, he's just getting in the way. I'm just getting in the way of this guy in front of me. But as you go up, you learn more. By high school, you're, you're pulling guards and you're blocking this one or you're doing zone blocking or man blocking. And so you know a little bit more and you get a little better and you put in a little more effort. Maybe you're good enough to become a Division I athlete. And then you're on a team and the whole world changes. Because being the best here makes you mediocre here. So you got to continue to learn. Maybe, maybe it's ballet. Once you reach a certain level, you realize how much you don't know. Once you reach a certain level, it's like, oh my gosh, I've been in this 10 years and I've just scratched the surface. Maybe it's the martial arts. The difference between a black belt and a beginner is inches. Just inches. A beginner is just throwing a right hand. But by the time it's a black belt, he understands that, no, I'm punching here. I'm punching with these knuckles. I'm extending here. I'm turning my waist. I'm doing this and put it all together. It's only a matter of inches acquired over a lifetime. You learn a little bit more. That is the way it is with your relationship with Christ. And I can tell you the last year of my life, as I've, as I've done this journey to, to be a local pastor... I'm like, oh my gosh. I've been teaching Sunday school for decades and there's stuff here that all of a sudden is different. All of a sudden, the, the, the communion bread. Okay. How many times have I had communion? The breaking of the bread, the shedding of the blood. There, there's a reason for all the little things. When you receive communion, it is usually handed to you. You're not supposed to take it. It's handed to you because Christ gave to you. You didn't deserve it. You don't take it from him. It is given to you. Those are the sort of things we just continue. This is a lifelong effort of hunger and thirst for his righteousness. But it is worth the effort. Perhaps... An illustration will wrap this up for you. There's a story of a, a little girl, curly blonde hair and blue eyes. She's at the checkout counter with her mother. And when the story was written, it was a dime store, so I'm just going to say the dollar store. <laughs> and she noticed this little box with these pearls. Oh, mommy, mommy, oh, mommy, can I, can I, can I? I'm, I'm sorry, sweetie. No, no. You're going to have to do that. You're going to have to get your own money. Okay. And so she goes home, opens her piggy bank. That's sure not enough. And, well, I've got a birthday coming up. I, maybe I could do some extra chores. And she, she begins to, to accumulate money from grandma. And, and then the day comes when she can go to the store and she can buy this little box with these plastic pearls. And she has these pearls, and she wears them everywhere, to Sunday school, to, to um, school, everywhere. She just had to take them off when she went swimming and bathed. They were her pride and joy. And so after some time, her father would come in at night, and he'd read her a bedtime story. And one night, he asked her, Will you give me your pearls? What? My pearls? No, 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 Dad. How about my stuffed horse? The one with the pink tail? You can, you can have that. No, no. No, sweetie, I, I, want, I want your pearls. No. He, he, so he, he told her, I love you. It's okay. He kissed her goodnight and went on his way. She went to sleep. Sometime later, Dad comes up to read the bedtime story. Will you give me your pearls? 
No, Dad, no. How about my doll? I just got that for my birthday. It has a yellow blanket. It has this. and I want your pearls. No, Dad, no. It's okay, sweetie. I love you. It's okay. So finally, time goes by, this, this routine, and he comes in one night to read her, her bedtime story. And he finds her sitting on the bed, cross-legged and very unusual. And he looks at her, and, and there's, a, there's a little tear on her cheek. What's wrong, honey? What's wrong? Oh, Daddy. And she lifts up her hand, and there are her worn plastic I give them up to you. And the father with one hand reaches out for the pearls. And with the other hand he reaches into his pocket. And he pulls this hand back and extends this hand. And in this hand is a velvet covered box. And as she opens it, she realizes her dad has just given her a genuine pearl necklace. He had the pearl necklace the whole time. But she couldn't give up the cheap artificial necklace in order to receive the genuine treasure. Are we doing that to God? He wants to exchange our cheap, artificial satisfaction for a true, genuine treasure. Are we going to give it up? Because sometimes it's hard to see what's in the other hand when he asks you to give something up. But he will not give you something less valuable than what he takes. Amen? Amen. I, I want to wrap this up with a, with a prayer from A.W. Tozier. Um, his, his book, In Pursuit of God. And it's a cry for holiness. Oh God, I have tasted your goodness... And it was both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need for further, further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire. Oh God, the triune God, I want to want you. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Show me your glory. I pray that I may know you indeed. Begin in mercy a new work of love within me. Say to my soul, rise up my love and come away. Then give me the grace to rise and follow you. From this misty lowland where I have wandered so long. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Jim. Um, this next song we'd like to sing is called Control, and it's about um, giving God that, uh, you know, giving, giving up uh, our desires and um, putting them in the Lord's hands giving him that artificial pearl necklace. So thank you so much, Jim. Um, let's rise and um, sing together our final song. Here I am, all my intentions, all my obsessions, I want to lay them all down in your hands. Your love is vital Though I'm not entitled Still you call me your child Oh God, you don't need me Somehow you want me Oh, how you love me Somehow that frees me To take my hands off of my life And the way it should go Control. 
fall through my hands We have planned to redeem and restore me You're behind and before me Oh, help me believe God, you don't need me Somehow you want me Oh, how you love me Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life And the way it should go God, you don't need me Somehow you want me Oh, how you love me Somehow that frees me to open my hands up And give you control Has the world lost its grip on you? May we let go of the cheap artificial things in our life that we might receive the true treasure. May we hunger and thirst for his righteousness. Go forward as a changed people. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.